Welcome back to normal baseball. The Dodgers routed out the Mets in game one of the NLCS, but luckily there is still a full series left to play. Welcome back to normal baseball once again. I'm Alex Normal Dog. That's Lewis. And today we are not just going to be talking about game one of the NLCS between the Dodgers and the Mets, but we will be talking about the entire rest of the series, what to expect from both teams, and what we think is going to happen for the rest of the series Obviously, the winner heads to the World Series. So it is the Grimace Mets against the Los Angeles Dodgers. Lewis, how excited are you for this series between two powerhouse teams? I'll be honest. I am really excited. It's the Grimace Never Say Die Mets against the Power of Friendship and Shohei Otani led Dodgers. Fun series. Then the fact that we get seven games out of this, I'm going to enjoy every moment. It is going to be a fun series, unless ever, all the games are like Game 1 just was. Game well, 1, the Dodgers got out to a very quick start against Kodai Senga and the Mets. Um, they scored two runs in the first inning, then they followed it up with another in it, another run in the second inning. Caught an early 3 nothing lead. A couple innings later, made it 6 nothing, and then late in the game, tacked on a couple more. They wound up winning 9 to nothing on just nine hits. Nine to nothing yeah. because the Mets pitching staff, I mean, Kodai Senga alone had four walks. Not what you want to see from your starting pitcher in game one. The Mets tried to do the thing that they did in game one with the Phillies and send Kodai Senga out there for maybe three innings, two, three innings, um, have him do his thing. Obviously, he's coming off an injury. He didn't get a chance to ramp up, so they can't just let him go out there and pitch for as long as he needs to or as long as he wants to. And then back him up with David Peterson. They were trying to do that again. Did not work out this time, though, because Kodai Senga, in just an inning and a third, gave up three earned runs. Like I said, four walks and a couple hits. They had to bring in Reed Garrett after him. And then they brought in David Peterson, who I can only assume was not fully warmed up by the time they needed him to come in, which is why they brought in Reed Garrett instead. Lewis, what did you think of this strategy? Because personally... I wasn't a big fan of it whatsoever, especially in the playoffs. Uh, I agree with you. Terrible, terrible idea. If you, like, I think we talked about it during the game of, yeah, Kodai Sanger, the goal was to get him to go about three innings, realistically, if you're the Mets. You know, one time through the order, one and a half matters. When it failed, the fact that David Peterson was not ready in time, like, I feel like, if you're Carlos Mendoza, you have to be saying to David Peterson, like, this is a start day for you. Get ready like it's a start day because we need you available after five pitches, like, at minimum. You know, that's just how that Dodger lineup works. It could go south so quickly, and that's what we saw against Kodai Senga, which sucked. And I'm hoping that that, that is not indicative of how the rest of the series will go for this, for this dodgers Met series. I just want to see some better baseball than tonight. It felt like the Dodgers dominated with relative ease they against did. a Mets pitching staff that has been pretty, very, not pretty, very reliable. I, I disagree with that. I mean, going into this series, one of my main points that I had was that the Mets have a lot to worry about in the bullpen. The Mets don't have reliable. they starting. Like, they're starting pitching staff. Oh, okay. Because the, the Mets, once you get to that Mets bullpen – I don't think there's much re reliability anymore. Edwin yeah. Diaz cannot yeah. be trusted. He's so hit or miss, and even when he, um, even when he, even when he gives up those, or rather, even when he does not give up runs and performances, it's always something. It always is is a close game. I mean, we saw it in NLDS Game Four. They did win. He didn't give up any runs. They won four to one, but the tying run came up to the plate, and it was Kyle Schwarber. So it's always got to be this this intense situation. Um, Phil Maton has not been great recently. I think a lot of Mets fans would agree with me when I say that. He cannot be trusted anymore. He was a guy that they could trust and was a great arm out of the bullpen, but he just has not been that in the playoffs. Um, in my opinion, I think Reed Garrett and Ryan Stanek are the only real guys that you can kind of rely on in that Mets bullpen to – not go out there and, and, and make it a scary situation. And I think that right. works out of the Mets' favor in a lot of ways. And and they did get hit. They did use Jose B uh, Buto Ooh. in this game. 
um, David Peterson got hit, but again, none of their none of their high leverage re- relievers really got hit. That the, being, I do also want to say though that is the Dodgers' mo of they have some of the best hitters on the planet for a reason. It's to get hits, and they've they've struck gold with guys like Teoscar Hernandez and playoff Kike Hernandez or Enrique Hernandez. Like it's just insane what that Dodger lineup did in Game One. Nine runs is nothing to just look at and be like, okay, let's move on to the next. From the Nets, that's a little deflating, but there's a reason why it's a series and not winner take all. Yeah, I just I wanted to go really quickly just back to why the Kodai Senga David Peterson piggyback. I'm just really not a fan to it, a fan of it rather, and I think it's time to put this to rest. I think it's time to end that experiment. I I, I mm-hmm. get Kodai Senga going out there, but. You can't assume that he's going to go three innings. You can't assume that he's going to go two innings. And I think that's a lot of what the Mets were doing. They were like, we're going to throw him out there. He's going to be able to go two, three innings, and then we'll bring in David Peterson. And they assumed that. And I just don't think in the playoffs you can make those assumptions that it's going to be that easy and it's going to go all according to plan. And they found out found out pretty quickly in this game. He, he really struggled. He could not find the strike zone. He could not find the strike zone. I think it was 14 or or 13 out of his first 16 pitches were balls. Like you can't have that, and and it just it snowballed from there. Yeah. Uh, again, if you're the Dodgers coming out of Game One, oh my God, we're feeling great right now. We especially we, with Mookie Betts hitting again. Oh yeah, we're Mookie, there. Mookie Betts is hitting. He had another uh, hit in this game. Obviously, the playoff struggles, similar to like Aaron Judge on the other side in the ALCS. A lot of worries about their postseason struggles. Mookie Betts is broken out of that, I'd say, officially. He did really well in that Padre series, and then coming into this series, he had a bases-clearing double. Yes, it was when the game was already 6 nothing, but you love to see your star player you know, put some numbers on the board uh, early in the series. And Game 1 is arguably the most important game of the series. Sets the tone. I mean, uh, you obviously, aside from Game 7, but... I think it was huge that the Dodgers took this game for themselves. And and Otani got hits. Freddie Freeman had two hits. Even a guy like Kike Hernandez, like you were saying, had two hits. So they were they were they were all hitting. It was a great game all around from the Dodgers. Yeah, yeah. It it, it was an impressive game from the Dodgers offensively. Let's not forget Jack Flaherty, seven no seven innings, no earned runs. Fabulous. And I actually had to write this down because I wanted to say this about Jack Flaherty's start. When any pitcher, not just Jack Flaherty, when any pitcher has that like low to like hip level breaking ball stuff that's just like on point hitting his spot every time, that's nasty. When a pitcher has the high high and inside fastball stuff working and it's working well, that's nasty. Tonight, Jack Flaherty put both of that both of those things together and spun seven beautiful innings of baseball. You have to give a massive round of applause to Jack Flaherty coming out and performing the way that he performed tonight. Yeah, he was dominant. I mean, he he got through that lineup that's been the hottest lineup in baseball at points with ease. In the postseason, they have been, no doubt about it. Yeah, I mean, off starters, they've been a little iffy. But even even then, he went seven innings. He went deep into that game. And he did exactly what the Dodgers needed him to do, only used two of their relievers and only one of them was a high high leverage reliever. That's exactly what you want because in this series going into it, my thoughts were if you're the Dodgers, your your main concern is the Mets are going to be seeing our relievers a lot. And that's a problem because the more the Mets see a reliever, the better they hit off him, off off them. It so so being able to not use your high leverage relievers because of Jack Flaherty's efforts is absolutely huge. Totally agree with you. And one thing that I had noted down down here before the game started was the Dodger bullpen has been locked down. Congratulations. They just tied a record for the entire pitching staff, just tied a record set by the 1966 Orioles, most consecutive scoreless innings in the playoffs. Awesome. Congratulations. But what I wrote down was the Dodger bullpen has been locked down this postseason. NLDS, they locked it down against the Padres, a great lineup. On the other side, the Mets have been historically good in late inning heroics. What what were you thinking was going to break first? Did you think that the Mets' bats would slow down late in games? 
or did you think the Dodger bullpen would crumble or at least show cracks? What do, what do you think? I think if it was going to be one, it was going to be the Mets offense because solely based on the fact that it's that they were not dominating every single pitcher they saw, they were not playing well against starting pitching, and they were just getting to the bullpen. So at a certain point, you're going to stop getting to the bullpen. It's going to stop being about uh, the relievers uh, seeing them or throwing the wrong pitch, and it's going to be more about just we – we can't hit. We're slowing down as a lineup as a whole. If you're the Dodgers, you know, like you just said, they're coming off however many scoreless innings going 33. in. But going into this game, they're, they're coming off however many scoreless innings. I think they're they're thinking we're, we're riding high right now. And I think they're really confident in themselves. And I don't know. I just – I know that the Mets are the miracle Mets, and I know they thrive off off the relief pitchers. But maybe later in the series we'll see that. And it was Flaherty's game tonight, too. So it wasn't even like it's the relievers. Yeah, I, I agree with you. However, I will say before the game started, I did think the Dodgers bullpen would show a sign of weakness before the Mets lineup. After game one, I don't know how confident I am in that statement anymore, but I do just want to stay true to what I believed before the game. Yeah, the Dodgers have been lights out. I mean, in the in the NLDS... Um, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of their pitchers gave up no runs in their appearances. Of uh, their relief pitchers, rather. Um, That's crazy. One of them was Alex Vesia, who's not in this series because of a rib injury. Get well soon, Kane. Get well soon. Um, but yeah, no. It, when the Dodgers' starting pitching is going, I think that they have a, an extreme edge over the Mets because. What I heard from a lot of uh, of Mets fans and, and kind of what I observed by myself was when you looked at the Dodgers starting pitching, you, you're thinking now we're going to see a lot of their relievers a lot more. So when their starting pitching isn't pitching well, we have a significant advantage throughout the series. And sure. if But if their starting pitching is on point, that kind of throws your whole strategy out the window. Yeah, I mean, that's what I said about the Yankees Guardians. I said, you know, the more and more any team in baseball sees a reliever, the higher the chances that they can get to that right, pitcher but, eventually. And especially but it feels the Mets. Like this Dodger bullpen, after, especially after game one, sure, it was not, you know, seven innings from the Dodger bullpen, but still three innings of just shutting them down, which you just, the Mets have not done this postseason. The never say die Mets, like, turned over. And that sucks because this is not the time that you want this lineup to like go flat, especially against relievers in the later innings when the Mets have been very good so far this season. Yeah, this I, I mean, and I mean again, it is game one, so you know Jack Flaherty spun a spun a gem. We don't know what's going to happen in game two. We don't know what's going to happen the rest of the series. So I feel like if we made this before game one. Rather than after game one, we would definitely have a lot of different thoughts. And maybe totally. it's a little bit of recency bias just because the game just ended. But it it certainly looked like they were the Dodgers pitching was lights out. But now the worry becomes, going looking at game two, who is starting for the Dodgers in game two? Because if it's Walker Bueller, you're feeling good as a Mets fan, thinking yeah. Walker Bueller's not going to do he, – he, he can't do what Jack Flaherty just did to us. Walker Bueller has been a lot less reliable than Jack Flaherty has been. And that's just me assuming that Walker Bueller is going to start and they're not going to do bullpen. I think Yamamoto is going to start game three no matter what. That would be five days from his last start. That sounds right. And then game four would have to be a bullpen. I don't think Flaherty would be able to pitch game four already. So it would be a bullpen. So I don't know if they're going to do Bueller game two or bullpen game two or Bueller game four or bullpen game four. I think if you're the Dodgers, because you won the first game, you go Walker Bueller. And if you go back to New York, if you come to New York and you are up 3-0 in the series, you do the bullpen game. If the Mets have even won a game up to that point, then you have to go to a starter. I think that's the, the plan of attack if I'm the Dodgers. That's that's my feeling about it, at least. I think, I think I'm going to have to agree with you because even – with Walker Bueller, um, even if he plays bad, we saw it in game 
three against the Padres. He gave up six earned runs, but he still went five innings. So that saved oh, their yeah, bullpen yeah. for a couple innings. So again, yeah. like it just adds to that thing if in a game two early in the series, you want them to be seeing your relievers as little as possible. So it, even if Bueller can go five innings, that 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 makes them see your relievers less than a bullpen game would. So a, a, a bullpen game in game four wouldn't be that big of a deal because, well, it depends on if the Mets would win game three, but you just want to go as far into the series as you possibly can without them constantly seeing the same relievers. So a bullpen game in game two would not be setting yourself up to do that. I, I agree entirely. And just to, you know, keep the conversation rolling here, I do want to say I was trying to do research for this and figuring out, you know, Mets Dodgers, how does this shape up? Big market team, big market team. What are we thinking? And then I looked up their head to head stats. And one thing that caught my eye is that the Dodgers last played the Mets on May 29th, which is just a few days before June 12th, the day that Grimace threw out the first pitch. And that's when the Mets really got hot. So the Dodgers have never seen this version of the Mets that during the regular season after June 12th were playing double what they were 61 and 31 or 32, like insanely high level ball. And it just but game one is leaving a sore taste in my mouth. But for the rest of the series, I'm really expecting this Met lineup to come out and punch back more than or anything compared to how poorly they looked in game one. Right, because the Mets then came out to this game looking like they were the May 29th Mets team. Yeah, Brett Beatty, the spirit of Brett Beatty was in the house. I mean, Tomas Nito was somewhere smiling. You did have some of those feelings. I mean, like Jesse Winker had a really bad base running oh. error. Like you're down by, I think it was like four or five runs at that point. It might have even been six. And he was like trying to sh- sh- go to third. I get it. But like he slowed down and that's what and made him stopped. get tagged out. And around, stopped. Like, oh. like it was just a lot. It was, it felt like the old Mets, which yes, again, like, like you said, left a bad taste in my mouth. Cause that's not the Mets we've been seeing. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, to make even, to just kind of, you know, push the knife in a little bit harder here, the Mets' numbers against the Dodgers pitching staff that ha- that is going for this series, it's not looking too good. I mean, Alonzo's only 4 for 22 with 6 strikeouts. Lindor, 8 for 25, a little bit better with 2 homers, 8 strikeouts though. Nimmo, who I thought would be a big X factor coming into this series because they need another, like a third guy to really step up. That's not Mark Vientos, who is probably their best hitter in the postseason right now. Nimmo's only two for 15 with nine strikeouts. It does not look good for the Mets, but I was hoping that their pitching would be better. Obviously, game one is leaving a bad taste in my mouth, but I, I, I will it's a series for a reason. I will say we do have to keep in mind that this was, with Senga and Peterson, this was the the most most unreliable start from the Mets in terms of like the rotation they've been using. I mean, now coming up in game two, you have Shaw Manaya, then you have Luis Severino, then you have Jose Quintana. Guys that, yeah. that have been a lot more consistent. Manaya's been incredible. Sevi's been consistently good. He's been giving you good starts. And Quintana's been giving you good starts. So this was the low point in their rotation. It just happened to be that the, it was game one that got that. I mean, Manaya could have pitched today, which which is a whole other story. Manaya could have pitched today, but he didn't. Um, but now looking to game two and even game three and game four, you have actual starters who you know can go pretty deep into the game, which which is a a positive coming out of this for the Mets. Oh, yeah, definitely. If you're the Mets, like, you push this one off. You're just like, listen, they got to us. What are you going to do? You saw the pitching. You know what you have to go up against. Game two should be a lot different on both sides of the ball for the New York Mets. I'm not counting them out of this series yet. No, I'm I'm not even close to counting them out of this series. I don't oh I don't think it's fair to count them out of this series whatsoever. So yeah, we're we're just we're gonna have to watch game two. I think a lot of this is because they lost nine nothing in game one. So which that, which it's just not a good look for a team that has been so hot to come into the NLCS as like the scrappy underdog like we see it every year and then usually they punch back a little bit nine nothing like on the road just i do want to say i was impressed well another thing i was impressed with with the dodgers was the sacrifice bunts 
They had two <laughs> sacrifice bunts in this game. They both led to runs. Uh, Tommy Edmond hit one in the second, and then Gavin Lux came around to score one batter later. And then Gavin Lux bunted in the second, in the fourth rather, and a batter later, Kike Hernandez came around to score. Pretty good. Yeah. That that is very. That I is very I, good. I enjoy that type of baseball. You know, they're not just going for the uh, the Shohei. big hit rally. They're saying, yeah. let's move the runners over. Let's get the runners in a, in a position to score here, and they did it perfectly. Shohei came uh, probably a combined six feet away from having a two homer game too, which was really cool. Yeah, really wish that he was able to just you know gotta hit the weight room a little bit more. Shohei, I know that you're <laughs> not buff enough. He had a couple more rockets. Curls, Oh, yeah, 117 or 16 mile an hour double off the wall. Are we joking? Like, Shohei, you're not real, dude. I love you, but you're not real. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Um, So, I mean, I guess this is the best time to ask. Who do you have winning this series and going to the World Series? I have it written down. And my prediction is Dodgers in seven. Okay. What about you? What do you What do you got for this series? Okay. So what I have, I, I like the Dodgers in seven beat, but I'm going Dodgers in six. Ooh, okay. And again, okay. we're taking the same team, but I, yeah. <laughs> before the series started, I, I I don't know. My stuff's all been written since yesterday, so I'm I'm in the clear. I, I've had the same way. I, I felt the same way. I, I I would like to. I could see it going either way, and I could see it going in seven. Um, but I I have Dodgers in six. I think that no matter what, obviously the Dodgers cannot clinch during this homestand. They only have two games at home. <laughs> when the series comes back to New York, I think that's when we really see it because that Dodger crowd. I don't know if it's the broadcast with Fox or if it's just genuinely like that quiet compared to the Comerica parks that we watch compared to progressive field Yankee stadium. Well, I think it's a known thing that, Oh, it's just boring. Well, I think, I think it's a known thing, a very known thing that they've been lowering the crowd noise. There were chants going on during the game. We were, we were watching at one point I was chanting along with the crowd. You were, that was fun. Again, I just think at some points you just can't hear it. Um, but it's just like another, another thing uh, I just wanted to mention is is like Yamamoto. If Yamamoto is pitching like he did, at the end of last series, like lights out, that's another huge sign. And then even if you have that bullpen game, that they were lights out in that game in the game that you saw them do a bullpen game, which would be th- that's three reliable pitching games right there before you get back to Flaherty. Even if Bueller's start doesn't go well, and if Dave, Dave start- Roberts has a lot of weapons at his disposal right now, so it'll be interesting to see what Carlos Mendoza and the Mets lineup do to adjust and hopefully not go through what just happened in game one again. Yep. I'd agree. And the only way we're going to find out is by watching. So that's, that's what we'll continue to do. And we will. The, well, one more question yeah, before go, we get out of here. Go for it. Go for it. Biggest X factor in each lineup. What do we think? So X factor as in like a guy that not everyone would, would assume. Yes, because I, I personally have one for each team, and I want to see what yours are. In each lineup. Yes. So, for the Mets, I'd probably go with Frankie Alvarez. Just okay. knowing how how dominant he could be with the bat if he gets hot. That's a big if, though. If he gets big, hot, big I think he could be an X-Factor. And then, especially with the arm, too, behind home plate. I mean, he threw out Otani in this game in game one. And then for the crazy. Dodgers, hmm, it, does Teo count? Yeah. I, I'm going to go with Teo that's Oscar why Hernandez. That's I had for the Dodgers. Yeah, I'm going to go with Teo Oscar Hernandez. I mean, we saw him hit that two-run or three-run homer game – or no, solo shot in, in game five, but then he had a three-run homer in game four, one of the other. Grand slam. Grand slam in game four, so – he certainly can be an underrated power pat when he needs to be. I think he's an X-Factor. Oh, totally. Uh, for my X-Factors, as I already said, I went with Teoscar Hernandez for the Dodgers, and I really think that Brandon Nimmo needs to start swinging that bat a lot better than what he has done during like the regular season. Not to discredit what he's done during the regular season, 
But I, I need him to step up to the plate big time if these Mets are going to at least take this game seven. The take this two game seven. All right. So, again, we will find out. I think that's a nice way to end it out. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and uh, follow. And we will see you guys soon when the next couple games happen or maybe even after the next game. All right. Peace out.